I have a dream. A dream today. That I welcome this kind of examination. We tortured some folks. The CIA is fundamental to America's national security. There is a war going on, the battlefields in the mind, and the prize is the soul. I don't believe anything the government tells me. But I want to say one thing to the American people. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to say this again. I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. I never told anybody to lie, not a single time, never. Hi. I'm Irv Kopi, host of Movie Theater. Let's go, Brandon. I yeah. agree. Wait a minute, I want a woman. I want a woman. Come on. All right, Cincinnati, it is time for this town to get down. This is the Midnight Rider News Show with S.T. Patrick. Hi, this is author and researcher Casey Quinlan. You're listening to Midnight Rider News Show with S.T. Patrick. Hello, America and the world. Welcome to the Midnight Rider News Show. I'm S.T. Patrick, your friendly neighborhood host, traipsing and traversing through the trials and travails that have so tempestuously and untruthfully been blasted into your eyes, ears, and minds by the state-sponsored talking heads, the court historians, and the textbook conglomerates that control information today. Well, tonight we have episode 174, Professor David Denton and the JFK Files. First, however, as per usual, let us clean this castle. Now, we're going to unlock this episode because we want to get the information out there about the conference in April. So it's important to get it out there to as many people as possible. So to help our friends in the JFK Historical Group and our friends in Project JFK, this is going to be a free episode, but this will be rare. Uh, We do want to remind everyone that all of our new episodes, all of them, are now at Patreon, that being patreon.com slash midnightwriternews, patreon.com slash midnightwriternews. Now, if you want to ask questions of of any of our show guests, and if you want to have them attributed to you on the show, there is only one way to do that. Patreon.com slash Midnight Rider News. And again, if you haven't checked out epi- uh, episode, uh, if you haven't checked out issue 12 of Garrison, the Journal of History and Deep Politics at MidnightRiderNews.com, you definitely need to do that. It is a cool issue with a cover story on Mohammed Atta. Very interesting information. Um, so check that out, midnightridernews.com. We'll be right back with our friend, David Denton. This is Dave Ratcliffe, architect and publisher of Radical.org. Why were early Warren Commission critics Vincent Salandria, May Brussel, and John Judge so valuable? For that answer, more on my relationship with Fletcher Prouty and how nuclear power ties into it all. Listen to episode 101 of the Midnight Rider News Show. David Denton is a professor of history at Alney Central College in Alney, Illinois, the land of Lincoln and my homeland. He teaches one of the only classes in America on the assassinations of the 1960s. And I realized that I've never really asked him how that class began. So we're going to do that tonight. We've talked to him about this class quite a few times because I, I just find it so interesting that that he's able to teach a class like that in such an open-minded way uh, in, you know, American public education. So uh, I'd like to hear the origin story of the class, though, because I don't really know if I've ever heard the story on how the class began. So that is on tonight's agenda. So let's get to it. Hey, David, thanks for being back on the show. Thank you, ST. Thanks for having me. Uh, Look forward to it. Yes, absolutely. Now, there's another conference this spring. There's usually the one in November in Dallas that everyone knows about, but there's also one in the Midwest sponsored by the JFK Historical Group and Project JFK. And of late, it's been in Alney and it's been elsewhere, but um, the Alney conferences have been fantastic, but it's a real special one this year. So why don't you tell us a little bit about it, please? Yeah, we've been wanting to the meeting the JFK Historical Group uh, and uh, Project JFK, the fellows from Kansas City, great guys. We, we collaborated in the past, uh, and uh, we've been looking forward to possibly going to Memphis 
in the in the springtime of course that's connected to you know that in april was the anniversary of king's assassination and uh we've managed to put this together we've had a lot of cooperation with ryan jones the historian at the king uh at the national civil rights museum who's uh, appeared at some of our conferences in the past and uh the conference itself is going to be, again, that political assassinations of the 1960s theme uh, will will be a little more tilted towards the King assassination since that's you know we're there in Memphis. I would say our got some great lineup of speakers as usual. I would say it's more about closer to 50-50 between the speakers about the King assassination and still looking at the JFK story. Of course the uh, What's relevant right now, I know you want to talk about it, is some of the uh, declassified documents and some of those things coming forth. And we will have speakers, including myself, who dealt with that. And uh, we're, the, the conference will also include a, a tour of the National Civil Rights Museum, uh, obviously the site where King was shot, the Lorraine Motel. So well, we're really excited about the uh, the what's coming up and hopefully the folks out there might still have an opportunity to want to uh, uh, sign up and join us. Sure. Yes. So if someone wants to sign up for the conference, either in person or online, how can they go about doing that? Well, the dates on it are April 13th through 15th. That's basically a, a we'll be starting Thursday evening, working through Saturday night, uh, Sunday, maybe some informal meetings on the 16th, but that's, uh, basically the time frame when our conference is being held. It's at the Crown Point, uh, Crown Plaza downtown in Memphis, Tennessee. And it's real easy to, to in terms of being able to sign up and or register for the hotel. It's uh, our uh, website, uh, jfkhistorical.com, or even if you put in, you Google JFK Historical Group, that'll take you right there for all the, uh, the, the aspects of that. Uh, we're frankly pretty close to being sold out for our book of hotel rooms, but you can still not too late to, to get on there and, and get signed up. I think our, uh, our special rate uh, goes off on uh, Monday, March 13th. So that's coming up pretty quick, but you can still sign up for the conference and we'd love to have anybody that's interested. And it's going to be a, it's going to be a great weekend. Uh, just to just to highlight some of the folks that'll be there, uh, uh, Dr. John Newman's going to be our keynote. He's obviously got some new revelations. He'll be talking both about the new things associated with the JFK assassination, and uh, he's got some new re- new material on the MLK story as well. And we're real excited to have him. Uh, of course, Ed Tatro. Long-time researcher, great speaker. Uh, he he is going to be delivering some information on uh, new revelations associated with the TFX fighter scandal and its con- potential connections to Dallas. It's a he's really excited what he's done there. Uh, Bill Simpich, who's an expert on the cl- declassified documents, he's agreed to come. Uh, we've got uh, William Claver, who's written on the RFK and MLK stories. Uh, um, Marty Bragg, Dan Storfer, who's done, done some great research on the MLK. Uh, David Knight, who's obviously been involved with me in, in, in doing some of these conferences. He's doing some new things on Jimmy Hoffa. I mean, we're, we're doing some, you know, it's not the same old, same old lineup. I mean, we got some of, uh, some really good researchers we've had before, but we also got some what you can describe as some new blood coming in for this conference. And I think it could, could be one of our best yet. You know, I, I encourage people to look into attending. If they can't make it in person, we're also offering a zoom option. You can also sign up for that on, on our website. Again, it's the JFK historical.com or JFK historical group, either one of those will get you there and hopefully we might get a chance to see some folks there. You mentioned earlier that a major focus of this event will be the new JFK file releases, as I suspected. And uh, I know that you've spent years going over them. You're just one of those guys, uh, you 
and uh, Larry Rivera and Doug Campbell and Rob Clark. Uh, you guys love these files, and and thank God that you do, honestly, because uh, man. When I start to go through them, I can do it for a while, but then my eyes just begin to glaze over as I thumb through needless title pages and access codes and department codes and all that. It can be really maddening at times, so we are glad that you do this work and that you enjoy doing this work. I, there are even times when I think I begin sort of thinking that they're intentionally confusing. I'm not sure if that's the case, but... It sure seems like it at times, but what kind of noteworthy items have you found in the newest file releases? Well, again, I, 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 you know, some of these things I have talked with you before, I haven't, and it's a kind of, you have to say it's an ongoing thing. It's, you're right, it is difficult to go into the, the files. They're not, you know, they're not really uh, in any kind of uh, order. <laughs> it's more of a, Although it has a search engine on it, that search engine is kind of spotty. You just really have to kind of go in there with an open mind and and you almost you know go through things and you stumble onto things actually. I mean, and, and then you if you you can feel like you can build a narrative around it. What makes what what does make what makes this important? What makes this relevant? And uh, Obviously, there there are a lot of things there associated with the Central Intelligence Agency and, and their activities, and um, I, I think there are things that that add to the story. I don't know if we we obviously haven't found the infamous smoking gun that people are always looking for. Yet, still, things I always say there's all a lot of smoking guns already out there for the past 50 years. I mean, this the stuff we found tends to add to the narrative. I think, and I, I just a couple of things that I've come across that I think are significant. Um, let's let's start with the CIA and their their behavior uh, after the assassination. Uh, and I, one of these things I think I've written about in, in, in Garrison a little bit, but a little more to add to that, uh, is it was pretty obvious that um, from the respect to the new documents, the CIA was basically, even by the spring of 64, was specifically, what do you want to call it, tracking, stalking uh, some of the early critics uh, of, of the, the low nut idea or this is even prior to the Warren Commission, so you can't say that they were attacking the Warren Com or defending the Warren Commission yet because the Warren Commission hadn't even came out. Uh, uh, a man by the name of, I believe it's Thomas Buchanan, one of the first books written in England about the critical of the, or of the, of, of the single bull or the, the low nut scenario, uh, the CIA felt it was important enough uh, then Deputy Director Richard Helms sends a classified memo to then private citizen Alan Dulles. He's, already, he's been fired from the agency, uh, making him aware of, you know, here we've got somebody out here who's writing uh, a critical uh, that's not sticking with the company line about the lone nut already. And again, Dulles is a private citizen. Why is a classified document being sent to him? I mean, were they already anticipating, already acknowledged the fact that Dulles was going to be on the Warren Commission, going to be their point man there? I think mean, those are some of the things I've seen uh, another document associated with that that I thought was the same parallel about another book that had come out. So the CIA was, was on the prospect of, however you want to call it, a cover-up early on. Uh, I think one of the more significant documents I've came across though is, is fast forward to 1968. Uh, and, and in fact, I've got the document in front of me right now. Uh, when the garrison uh, investigation was ongoing, this is a uh, March of 68. Uh, Jim Garrison had made a plan or planned to be, to go to the Netherlands to appear on Dutch TV. And it's interesting that the, the CIA is aware enough of Garrison's activities that they're basically tracking him overseas. And 
the, and it's a, the, the interesting thing about this document, it's a clear indication that they were willing to use disinformation. In fact, I'll quote here from the document. It says, consideration is being given to forwarding to the station at The Hague overt derogatory information about Garrison uh, from the United States press for release to uh, their assets there. So the CIA was actively engaging in a, a disinformation program uh, against Garrison, even overseas. And the document also talks about how Garrison was convincing uh, that that his uh, that that, uh, that he had favorable reviews, uh, that that he had credibility, and so on and so on. So you you, you see the CIA is actively involved, aggressively involved in the in the process of of trying to cover up or attack critics of the of of uh, any scenario that that um, you know anybody other than the fact that Oswald was acting alone i think those are some of the things uh, and then uh, uh then i i think another important document that i'm trying to you know somebody sometimes i just see things and i like okay let's can anybody else make sense of this cuz i can't you know I, so I, sometimes i talk about things like I'm hoping somebody can clarify some things. And you're right. When you go into the documents, you see a lot of code names. I think the, the Mary Farrell site is a great site. Uh, I think that Bill Simpich kind of, uh, no, excuse me, not Bill Simpich, uh, Rex Bradford uh, is, does a great job with that site in terms of deciphering some of the codes of the CIA. Uh, you, you run into things like uh, just for a handy reference, like, uh, the term Kubark, K-U-B-A-R-K. If anybody's in the documents and see that, that's code for, that's what the CIA refers to themselves as. I don't know why. It's a, it's a, it's a code name, Kubark. Uh, and uh, the, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald is always referred to in the CIA documents as G.P. Floor. Uh, and why? I, this, the name, that, that's what they attach to him. It's interesting, though, that that if Oswald was just a lone nut, why why does the CIA feel the need to attach a code name to him? Interesting, right? But yeah, GP Floor that was Lee Harvey Oswald. But uh, one document was significant. Uh, I felt like that I came across as a handwritten document. I presume it was a House Select Committee was given notes on ZR rifle. And I'm sure everyone has a familiarity or should with, with that. That was the uh, program for assassination started in 1961 of, of Castro, uh, you know, and uh, it was headed up by the infamous William Harvey and, and uh, Dave Morales was brought on board with that as well. And, and the document goes across in detail all the, ins and outs of what ZR rifle was trying to co- accomplish, what, what they were, you know, parameters were things, you know, stuff that I'm not saying is, was, isn't already public knowledge, but at the end of the document, it's got some handwritten stuff that I just is all in code. And I, and it's almost nonsensical, you know, and I, you just like, you need that decipher, but there's one term on there that I've been trying to to reach out to other researchers too about this, and I haven't gotten anywhere. But the reference to something called the magic button, I have no. I'm trying to figure. It has to mean something. What it is, I don't know. But it's almost like a mysterious thing, the magic button. So if anybody out there knows what the hell the CIA was talking about there, it's associated with ZR rifle. But again, that's just some of the stuff that I've come across. I think at the end of the day, uh, the documents can add to the narrative. If, if you're looking and you, and you, you can uh, bring some significance to it and you're willing to kind of just dig in and keep, keep after it, there's, there's things there that are significant. Oh, there absolutely are. And, and I think some not in the field are are quite surprised to find that we actually have 
found uh, quite a few interesting things over the years and things that matter. I mean, some out there, sure, think, you know, if we haven't found the one document that that uh, has all the names of all the shooters and their locations and who hired them and who paid them and the names, the dates, the times, then we haven't found anything at all. But there are others, I think, that are quite impressed that we have found so much. Uh, so the reactions do still vary. You and I both know researcher and author Jefferson Morley, a uh, very good writer and a very smart guy. And he is uh, convinced that the smoking gun, for lack of a better term, resides in the CIA documents on George Joannides. So what I want to ask you today is, are you as convinced that Joannides is the sort of final key to the case, or do you have some reservations about maybe going too far down that path and potentially finding very little? You know, I've tried to, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about that, ST, and, and you know, it, it really kind of, until we actually see what what's there, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to, it's it really is speculation or opinion. Um, I know that Worley has been on that for what what a decade, right? I mean, he has fought the right, CIA yes. tooth and nail, and done all sorts of things and tried to of uh, freedom of information requests and, and so on and so on. And there's still uh, a, apparently a batch of documents associated with George Joannides. And of course, the background story is Joannides was appointed to be the House Select a liaison for the House Select Committee when they were investigating the assassination and then later to find out that Joe Nides was directly involved with some of the most anti Castro Cuban suspects in all this. And uh, what are they holding back that might be revelatory? It's a great question. I I don't know if in in, in to Jefferson's credit, he managed to probably get more attention to this story than we've gotten in a long time. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, it really, in, in over just, you know, these, de these deadlines keep coming up and, and it, you know, both president Biden and both and president Trump have continued to play the delay game and releasing the rest of the documents uh, starting in 2017 and in the names for various reasons. I mean, you've seen multiple. I mean, I think Trump was saying that, hey, we're going to just release them all to the last minute. And some national security types like Henry Kissinger, I guess, came and visited him. And then all of a sudden, this could be irre irreversible damage to national security, you know, or and or with Biden. Biden's talked about the uh, COVID. And, and, and I, I think there's probably a legitimate you know, if you understand all these and these number of documents that are out, and and the the, the 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 sheer volume of them and all the redactions that's going with them, yeah, I mean, it, the, the National Archives has a serious uh, undertaking to to just get these things all out. There might it might be more, more of a just a need to have a rolling release as opposed to just you know, dumping everything out, though we'd like, certainly like to see them all. My opinion about, uh, you know, the whole thing with Joe and 90s, and, and this is, I think it has the potential to, to what I would describe as to move the needle on this situation or, or, or uh, force a, a recognition that once and for all that, Oswald wasn't just a lone nut. I mean, to me, that's that's what the Joannides thing could potentially prove that the CIA was it was connected to and monitoring Lee Harvey Oswald prior to the assassination. Now, I get it. This might just lead to more of a limited hangout. Like, it, like for instance, uh, I, you know, I don't know if you were you were watching the, the, the media's reaction to this and back in December, because it, frankly, to the credit of, you know, the media has always distorted and ignored this story. We're all, we're, we know all about that, but they seem to pay more attention this time. Why are these documents being withheld? Is there something more here? I mean, 
anywhere in this spectrum went from Fox News all the way to MSNBC. You saw appearances by folks, you know, Morley was uh, interviewed multiple times. Uh, Larry Schnapp is going to obviously be talking at our conference. Who's a attorney been involved with the, uh, the trying to force the release and suing the president of the United States to get these documents out. Uh, I think that it might be a lim- kind of a limited hangout for some. I mean, like uh, I recall uh, watching the, our good friend, I say that sarcastically, Gerald Posner, who was on uh, on uh, Fox with Tucker Carlson. And Carlson, you know, he's a firebrand. And, uh, you know, obviously some stuff there about him I'm, I'm not in, in line with. But Carlson basically almost got him forcing to admit, you know, maybe the CIA was involved with this thing. And, 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 and Poser made a statement of, you know, he, he went to the, the, this is what I call a limited hangout. It's all of a sudden now the CIA was, uh, negligent in that they had information on Oswald and didn't do anything about it. To me, that's going to be the limited hangout with the Joe and Ides thing. You know, you understand what I'm saying? The, it, it's going to move the needle. It's going to force. It, 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 the, that's my speculation. The Joe and Ides documents may well force our agencies to admit that Oswald just wasn't a lone nut, that he had some intelligence connections, and that. But now, you know, it's more about just failing to react to him beforehand. Which you and I both, of course, is, feels BS. But that's how I see it. I'd, I'd say I think they can move the needle. Is if, you know that that's a cliche. So be it. And uh, any time we can move the needle, I'm happy about it. Right. <laughs> that's where I'd say this is going to be at. Well, right. The limited hangout, as you said, is also the take of Philip Shannon as well. You know, he's been the favorite JFK author of, of stations like NPR for the past few years. It's it's oh, man, it's awful to hear him talk on there uh, because he's taken that exact stance. It's like it's like they know how preposterous the lone nut take is right now with all the documents that have come out and all the documentaries. So now they need to sort of latch on to what is the next best thing, which happens to be this exact take. But we now know that the CIA had a 201 information file on Oswald for two years, and he was not an unknown. That's not even a theory anymore. That's fact. That is proven fact in this case. We know this. So there can really be no more believing that he was an angry, loner, pro-communist. That's over. That is done. The CIA had been trailing him for two years for a multitude of reasons. Uh, yeah, and that's that, that's correct. And, and I mean, there's just so many things to the, to the story with Oz. And, and, and it, it's frustrating. You still see people that, you know, still try to take the, you know, without dragging all the way in the back of the single bullet theory and all those things. But, you know, it's still, you know, 60 years down the road, there, there are people who still go you know do all sorts of twists and turns to try to to justify the single bullet theory or that oswald i mean uh, from a to me from a historical basis there's extremely unlikely that lee harvey oswald took any shots that day let alone was part of a conspiracy or not you know yeah and yet some people still try to twist and turn and you see those those you know the, to me a series of improbabilities leads to impossibility and everything about what happened in Dallas and trying to to, to pin this all on Oswald is a series of improbabilities but not impossibilities leading to an impossibility and you, you have to look elsewhere and you have to look in a in a broader fashion, and, and I, you know, we, and I know a lot of the documents look at the CIA, and the, but you know, I think this is this is bigger than the CIA. I think there were folks in other positions of power that were involved in this story as well, and and, and I think they had that the, there are documents that, for instance, and I we talked about this before about the 
uh, actually the small counterintelligence unit operating without for the United States military, which was deeply interconnected with the CIA and, and was taking radical positions about assassination against Castro. And, and there's good evidence to suggest that uh, one of their people, Dorothy Matlack, was, was primarily in charge, who was a, a, inter, a liaison between the CIA and the, the military and actually to to track Oswald in Russia. I, I honestly believe she was, the, you know, she was assigned the task of of uh, tracking quote unquote fake defectors. And, you know, timeline. You know, 1958 doesn't take a whole lot to figure out who probably she was watching. Uh, so there's there's these things in the files that we that we have to look at. I, I don't, Joe and Ides, I hope it's, uh, at the end of the day, is as explosive as Jefferson Morley hopes it will be. I think there'll still be folks that, though maybe they'll be forced to move the needle, they'll still do the limited hangout thing, as I describe it, you know, the CIA idea. Well, we'll, we'll give you a little bit, but we're not going to give you the whole story, right? I mean, that's that's how I kind of see this whole thing unfolding. Now, I want to say that I, I respect you very much, and I've had the honor to watch you teach in class. It's a, it, and, and that was a real pleasure to do so. Uh, you and Jim Mars, I believe, are the only two instructors that I've known who have specifically taught a course about this case. Uh, Jim Mars has, has sadly since passed away, but he taught his at the, the University of Texas at San Antonio, I believe, and you teach yours at, at Olney Central College in Olney, Illinois. Now, we talked about the class before and about how fascinating it is to teach that class. I, it, you know, it dawned upon me recently that I've never asked you how the class began because I just have this mental image of you going into a Dean's office and saying, you know, I kind of have this idea (laughs) and then having to sort of argue for the class. But, um, I've heard you say a few things and that's not exactly how it happened. So for everyone out there, uh, Tell us a little bit, if you would, about the origin of this class. Well, first of all, it's mentioned in my name the same breath of Jim Mars. That's that's high praise. But and then there are some. You now there, I think there's some other folks uh, that have taught classes like this. I mean, I can't sit here and go go down the list, but but it, but you're you're right. It is very rare, and uh, you know. Uh, uh, 20 years ago is when I first started this. Uh, and I, you know, I'd already done some stuff, you know, given talks from, in at my college campus and at other places. Uh, prior to that, I was on a speaking engagement with, uh, Illinois, the Illinois Humanities Council, where I went around and gave speeches and, and uh, you know my administration was just pretty open minded. They, they're more they were more about you know the fact that hey this is an interesting topic. This kind of gives us a little bit of of a you know name per se. They've always been open minded about that. And I had a dean that came and said, hey look you've given talks about why don't you teach a class on this? I said, Good idea. <laughs> so I you know I started it up and you know I. I thought I'll just take it one year at a time. And here we are 20 years later. It's, it's fascinating material. I you know, the class is entitled political assassinations of the 1960s, where I basically cover the three major political assassinations. I feel that are out there, you know, that's kind of the theme of our conferences. And, and I got an entire semester to go into depth to go into every aspect to go into the same day evidence and expand from there. Who was Lee Harvey Oswald? various theories, um, and, you know, and, and try to give some synopsis of, you know, what's the ultimate question who may have done this, where, who was behind this and, and spend not as much time, but significant time also on the RFK MLK stories as well. And I, I just have found that number one, yeah, young people don't know a whole lot about this because they, it's not their generation. They didn't, they didn't live through it, but at the same time, they've heard things and they're curious. And if you get them in there, 
it, it's pretty easy to get them hooked. They want, once you lay the stuff out, they're they're kind of fascinated with the story. I've I've just basically relied on recruitment from one year to the next by the people that take the class. I just say, hey, get the word out and tell other people this is a good class, a great class, and they and they keep coming back. You know, so as long as I've got some students that are that are interested in coming in and, and hearing what I got to say, I'll keep going with it. But there wasn't anything, you know, explosive about how or amazing about how I got it. You know, I just feel like that I'm fortunate enough in a place where folks are open-minded. They don't have a, a broader concern about, what's this going to be, you know, how's this going to play academically? I just haven't run into that kind of interference where I'm at. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes perfect sense. And again, it shows what a good school Alney Central College is. And yes, I'm absolutely bragging on Alney again. Uh, you know, the idea that the dean asked you to teach the class and not vice versa, that you didn't have to beg to teach the class, is really, um, I think, indicative of a really good environment. And again, we're going to talk about small colleges a little bit later, but um, yeah, I think that's a fine example. I was also thinking about the parameters of the class recently, and you maybe, gosh, maybe sadly, uh, have a lot of content available to you. Not only do you have the three acronyms, uh, JFK, RFK, and MLK, but even confining it to the 1960s assassinations alone, you have Malcolm X, you have Evers, you have Hammerskold, you have Che Guevara, you have Fred Hampton, just to name a few. It was a very violent time. Yes, and, and a matter of fact, you know, in in November in Dallas, we did, in fact, uh, Larry Rivera, you know, great researcher who's been, will be in Memphis as well. I didn't mention him, but... Uh, he actually gave a two-hour presentation on the Malcolm X story. And, of course, we know that has really kind of jumped out there in the headlines within the last year where basically, number one, a you know judge ruled basically that the gentlemen that were convicted of the Malcolm X assassination were falsely indicted. And now I think there's some, some of the Malcolm X family are, are – got a lawsuit i know that came out made public uh, uh in, in, you know in terms of so that, that so that that story is definitely a a, a prime story um uh, and as far as medgar evers uh we're, we're actually de- de- delivering a presentation on on the medgar evers story david knight is going to be talking about that in memphis so yeah those are relevant things um uh, are, are they all intelligence involvement there you know i mean hey, let's just say this way i mean the the, the I, I think you can confidently say you know through the 1950s and 1960s the cia was running a rogue operation with no accountability that that had that had uh, assassination capabilities extreme radical viewpoints within the elements of the agency so Take it for what it's worth. I mean, uh, to, the, to the degree of involvement in, in the, the multiple assassinations to, to pursue an agenda, I think it's a, sadly a, a, a reality of life in America in, in the post-Cold War era. Well, in the 1960s, I think we were also still, what, 30 years out from the information age? You know, the intelligence services, I think, felt more confidence engaging in these violent acts because news traveled slowly and and they could be covered up in due time. And with so few uh, with so few television outlets then, owning a few major assets within those, what, ABC, NBC, CBS, and PBS, um, owning those assets as as Carl Bernstein described in his famous Rolling Stone piece, uh, was extremely important to those agencies, and they did that very well. But it's also impossible now to fully control people around the world chatting and sharing information in real time. Now, does that mean they stop trying? No, they do try. They try very hard, and they do pretty well. Um, 
but it's a much harder now than it was in say what 1963 for example you know and, and i think i think we also had a stronger belief in the state then so that also aided their actions we were more apt to not believe that the state could do such horrible things um so that doesn't mean that we also haven't done well in this research and in and in, in, in changing our attitudes you've obviously done a tremendous job with your class um Here's my concern, though. I Here we are now in 2023, and I'm wondering if the JFK community's time has really come to a relative end. I mean, we are aging, uh, as much as I hate saying that, and more of the top researchers are passing away each year. And more than anything, I think the hierarchy in this JFK research community has failed in doing what it needed to do to take this case to high school and college kids in mass. I think too many within the hierarchy have spent too many years writing and speaking to please one another, to get a back pat from one another, to show off and show out for one another with a very little concern for what happens to this community 30 years down the road. Well, now here we are about 20 more years down the road and knowing that in 10 years even it's going to look like a very different community than how it looks today so are are we in danger of going the way of say the pearl harbor uh that at the fdr had foreknowledge of pearl harbor community or uh you know the bombing of the Maine was an inside job that 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 started the spanish-american war community i mean those are still two important communities, don't get me wrong. They're important historically because it's always important to set history right, but they are far from vibrant. Are we going through a natural process of aging out as a community, or have we just done a horrible job of doing what needed to be done to keep this alive? Well, I think the, 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 with that, with respect to that, of course, you know, as time wears on, Witnesses die off. Time, you know, it become. It doesn't mean that history can't be explored, revised, changed. You, you see that. I mean, you know, I, I've spoken before how you know how in some cases that that you know you get history is not etched in stone. That the, the the best thing we can do is come to grips with what the truth of our past is. That we're better off for it. In fact, it's essential for the survival of anything we want to refer to as a democracy. It is is openness, justice, truth. And I know that sounds like Superman, but <laughs> but I, I, maybe I take a take a simplistic view of that but if we if we're not constantly in the pursuit of that then then we're always in danger of being hoodwinked deceived uh, overtaken by authoritarians who want to destroy democracy and 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 base things on fascist falsehoods uh, we we've got to make every effort to always get to the truth about things, even if it's 40, 50, 60 years down the, down the road, you know, I mean, um, we're always better off for it. Well, you know, whether, you know, the United States military admitting that they did experiments on African Americans post world war II. I mean, we, at least the government admitted to that. I mean, I don't know if we can force the government of the United States to admit it's, it's, uh, it's uh, whatever complicity in what happened with the, these political assassinations that we've talked about or not, but you still, or at some, at some institutional level, I mean, can we, what I mentioned earlier, move the needle, uh, whether it be in the academic world and how to see JFK, JFK assassination is portrayed or, with the media. And I think that, that was, again, I say that was encouraging what happened in December. I have not, it's been a long time. If ever I've seen the media come as close to, to, uh, not just dismissing the JFK assassination as another paranoid conspiracy theory anymore. You know, that they're actually openly 
contemplating maybe there was some involvement uh, in terms of even the CIA. I mean, that, that that's something. But the, but the thing you were talking about, about research, the research community, well, they've always been divided. They probably always will. The problem is, is that, you know, that this whole thing has been a, a kind of a, a kind of a mysterious Rubik's cube, whatever, from day one, the fact that JFK had so many uh, potential enemies that, that could have benefited from the assassination, the, the lack of a legitimate investigation has left the door open for all sorts of various, sometimes beneficial uh, research and viewpoints, but not a unified front. It never has. I doubt that it will be in terms of where this group is at in terms of, you know, what happened in Dallas. I mean, I, you, but at the end of the day though, you, you still got to keep, keep trying it. To me, it's always been about a grassroots thing anyway, that you, like you said earlier, we've got to keep, you know, making folks aware of things at the ground level as much as we can. And there are a lot of, I think there are a lot of, of the high school teachers across this country that are, that are not inhibited and, and taught about the JFK assassination openly and not just the lone nut stuff, you know, I think, but education going forward. Yeah. It's, it's going to be a key if, if we're going to, get to a point where we can wake up one day and, and look at a textbook and see something besides a uh, lone nut Lee Harvey Oswald shot the president. That, that that's, that, that's the best, the best thing we can hope for at this point. It's some revision of history that, that in, in an open, just and free society, we have to make, continue that pursuit. If we want to claim our, it, it, that makes democracy harder, you know, it's not, you, you know, if we were a fascist state, you know, big brother, or, or you know, what was, the, the, what was that line from 1984? The, the, our final order, I'm paraphrasing is to no, no longer believe what you see or hear with your, uh, you know, just what we tell you. Well, that's, that's the problem. You know, if, if we get to that point. Well, <laughs> here we are. I mean, here yeah. we are right now, right? And I I say this often, but history is hard. And it's hard for reasons that we've discussed on past episodes, you and I. You know, history is comprised of people. And people are conflicted. And people lie. And people have motivations. And because people lie, documents lie. Because documents are written by people. And audio and video can both be edited so well now that it's indistinguishable from raw audio and video to the naked eye. So while the information age has, has made the sharing of history easier... It's also made a defrauding history easier. You know, you you almost have to rely on instinct to some degree. And there is a certain researcher out there who thinks it's heresy to say that you have to rely on instinct at all. She, she'll say all the time, it's, it's you know, it's only facts. But who's facts? Yeah, yeah. And facts are, are, are very murky sometimes. Um, and so you do have to rely on instinct to some degree because... It can be hard to trust every source. It can be hard to believe every source. Engaging motivations, also hard. So, and then once you have all this, you have to put it all together when the picture is never, yeah, ever complete. This to to, is hard. Not to get too philosophical, but, you know, Plato in the Republic talked about, you know, the ultimately the, you know, how you... You know, he, who was Plato was pretty anti-democratic. Obviously, he wrote the Republic, right? He 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 feared the power of the masses, and he saw the demagogues and how they manipulated the masses in ancient Greece, and that's why he wrote the Republic, basically. But he made a point about that, you know, that that ultimately the the the, the educated elite, the philosopher kings, would have to just basically tell the masses clever stories. So they, you know, they don't have to tell them the truth anymore. Just tell them clever stories and that they don't need to know the truth. Right? <laughs> so, I mean, 
in some ways you, you look at the, the you know that kind of way was sold to the public after the Warren Commission you know that you know that that this thing you know we're, well we're going to keep this stuff but there, it's too 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 dangerous you don't need to know 75 years I remember my parents making comments like that like like they were sold this idea that well maybe we're not supposed to know <laughs> and that is that is I can say that is a bad thing, right? <laughs> when the public becomes convinced that they don't really need to know, it's not a big deal. I mean, that is the ultimate naivety there, you know, if, if, if we get to that point. Well, here's an example of how history is hard or how history is complex. I did this article for Garrison one time. It was about these halftime heroes shows at, at, at NFL games. Now, what we knew was at halftime, they brought out these heroes. They would have flags the size of, of the entire field. They would have a flyover or something, or they would play some kind of God bless the USA, some kind of patriotic song, and they would give a plaque, a medal, an award, whatever, to, to someone who had fought in, in a war in some kind of way. What we didn't know was that these halftime hero shows were were paid for by the Pentagon as recruitment yeah, yeah. tools in NFL games and mainly NFL games because NFL has the most conservative slash faux patriotic audience. At least that's what the research said. That's what the research that the Pentagon said. Um and so that's why they spent the money on NFL games, particularly. Sure, they did other sports as well. But these were bought and paid for recruitment yeah. tools. Now, were they actually hurt in war? Yes. Were they real people? Yes. So even when you have facts, you can still use those facts for uh, very questionable purposes. Yeah, and you mentioned that with the military. I mean, that that whole series of events, the fact that the military decided to, however you want to say, use the NFL as a platform to, you know, hey, the, you know they have to do their recruiting thing like any other institution. They, you got to have people to join the military. You got to, you know, but if, using the NFL to, you know, whatever you want to propagandize the, you know, military service, I don't know, but I know this, that that you know, that led to the whole thing ultimately to the whole controversy with the Kaepernick because before the military got involved with the NFL, I mean, it wasn't even, I mean, NFL teams were not even on the field during the national anthem. And then all of a sudden, you know, as part of the deal, I think that players had to be out there lined up and be all part of the, the national anthem thing as part of the agreement, you know, then ultimately Kaepernick does his thing. And then we have this huge controversy, uh, you know, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I get what you're saying that, that, uh, how, how, you know, we can maybe be somewhat manipulated in a, in a medium. There's, you know, there's so much, uh, so such a broad, spectrum of media outlets, social networks, attempts to get both facts or disinformation in, in the same arena. You know, the fights we are having right now over social networks, Twitter, whatever, about what should be censored, what should not, or who to speak, should, you know, should Trump be tossed off Twitter, let back on, what what's the, you know, Facebook, I mean, it, 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 I'm getting a little more academic here, but again, it, uh, there, it, there's a sociological term called culture lag, where we were exposed to all this wonderful new technology uh, in terms of openness, in terms of social networks and, and information, like you said, the info. Yet, how do we deal with the, the flood of disinformation that goes with it? How do we control it do we do we discourage free speech in the process how do we get discerned through all the the whatever it is out there garbage and and get to the facts even though we have all this information in front of us st 
the facts might be harder to ascertain than maybe they were 30 years ago. I don't know. That's a scary thought, right? Well, right. And it's for that reason that I am very uncomfortable with anyone being thrown off social media platforms for um, for almost any reason. I would say any reason, but then someone always comes back at you and says, oh, not any reason, huh? Well, then what about? And then they say the most outlandish thing possible, some crazy example that you have to say, oh, yeah, well, I guess that one. So for right now, I'll say for almost any reason, I I like having the autonomy to decide myself what is fact and what is nonsense. Now, will most people research? No. And again, even if they did, are they trying to do real honest research or are they, or are they trying to self-validate with some sort of confirmation bias? Well, here we go again, right? History is hard. But I don't like others deciding yeah. that for me. And I do believe that we have gotten to the point in society where social media is more of a platform, a utility of sorts, though, yes, privately owned. That is right. more than a publisher yes, like Verizon or AT&T, also privately owned. They're not going to throw you off of your plan for what you say on the phone. And I don't think that social media should either. Well, there, here's the thing. I, on one side, it is that in an ordinary world, before these social networks became such huge deals, I mean, any type of thing that you would get onto, you would sign a user agreement. You're supposed to behave yourself, right? And you don't follow the guidelines that the that that organization that you tie yourself into, whether it be Facebook or Twitter, has a right to you know, ban you or whatever. I mean, it's their, their private network. The problem is these things have become so big and so important. And then who gets to, you know, who's running these operations and having the, having the power to almost like, like you say, play God, like Zuckerberg and Elon Musk, you know, those guys, they have enormous power now. I mean, to be, to, to, to call balls and strikes under that circumstance. Uh, and, and I, you know, I don't have the answer to it. I, I think, I think disinformation on those network social networks have been done a great deal of damage in our political system. But I, like you say, what, what's the alternative limiting free speech? I mean, that's why I came back to the comment. I mentioned earlier from sociology, culture lag, we, you, you, well, the material culture presents all these wonderful new technologies, but then how do we catch up with our, our principles, our morals, our, our values, and how do we apply them to all this new technology that we're exposed to? And we may have trouble dealing with it. That's an understatement, <laughs> you know? I mean, well, right, right. I mean, when I was in elementary school, and you were also probably taught this, I was taught that George Washington chopped down the cherry and said, Father, I cannot tell a lie. And so yeah. this was um, an example of the character of George Washington. I don't think I was actually taught until high school or college that this was complete propaganda. And uh, so this sort of thing has been happening since what the dawn of time it just has more of a fuel it can be exponentially advanced with the technology and the social networks and whatever that we have available you know where it's obviously american revolution was a highly successful because of the fact that the the the, the, the successful amount of propaganda utilized by American revolutionaries who understood it. They, they used the media to, in, in an incredibly effective manner and they succeeded in their goals because of that. So I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, I don't have any solutions for it other than fo folks, as I always tell people in my class, you need to be discerning. <laughs> you better, you know, out there, somewhere out there, there are facts and you better be looking <laughs> for them, you know? <laughs> No, I think that's the perfect answer. I think that's exactly right. You, you've you got the right to to read things or not read things. You have the right to shut the television off or turn it on. You have the right to go to the library or not go to the library. You can be an information-based human being if you choose to be. But again, it's a lot of work. 
but too many Americans, that's not, too many Americans don't, don't want to do that. You know, they want to, they want to, you know, they, you know, have something put in front of them. They'll sounds good to me. You know, I mean, don't, don't go into any depth about it. Go for the simple solution or answer. <laughs> right. Again, I mean, it's, you know, it's the whole, just tell me what I need to know in 10 minutes. I've got to be in front of the television because it's Blake Shelton's last season on The Voice. And uh, and and then you just look at them like, like your head's about to explode. But uh, speaking of education, <laughs> I want to get back to Alney again, because I want you to brag on it for a little bit. I was thinking the other day, and I was talking to someone about how... Uh, how the Midwest has really fine colleges. And by colleges, I literally mean junior colleges and these small Division II, Division three schools in Iowa, in Wisconsin, in Indiana, in Illinois. I think it is sort of an educational hub for the small college. And, uh, I mean, we have some schools that are outstanding that most people hearing this show right now have never heard of. And it's impressive, and Alney is one of those. Well, you're correct. You know, I was just speaking from Illinois, this Illinois standpoint. I mean, uh, you know, Illinois takes some heat for a lot of things, but I think educationally, uh, and I've seen studies that show Illinois is, is very high on the educational level uh, compared to other states. I think some of that has to do with, you know, we've, uh, I'm a pro union guy. I think the uh, unions are allowed to 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 be active and be strong, where teachers can get a decent wage and some security, and you can have more quality people teaching. I think that's part of it. But I also think that part of it is the community college system you're talking about as well. Uh, that's throughout the state where, you know, in district, you know, we, we operate here in Richland County and our district is a little wider than that. Uh, we're, we're connected to, in fact, to the Illinois Eastern Community College is really a five campus district in, in the area. And, and what it, the benefit is, is, as you said, it's a affordable education where you can, you can get a, a two year degree, and for some folks, that's what they're looking for with, you know, especially in vocational areas, or you can, you can move on to a, you know, four year university and, and families can save incredible amounts of money if they, if they have that option for them, as opposed to sending students to four or five years at, to a university. And it's, it's still good quality education and, uh, and folks can benefit from it in, uh, you know, I, and I, you know, I think that's a, kind of the, the key to the fact that, the, you know, our educational system in Illinois has been pretty successful that, that, uh, you know, and, I, and I'm very supportive. I know the state of Tennessee, strangely being a conservative state as it has, actually offers free community college to everyone in their state. I, and I know that's been proposed at the national level. I'm, I'm a I'd be a big proponent. You know, if you really want to uh, catapult the educational system in America, it's almost like adding on a couple more years of of, of free or, or low cost schooling for students beyond high school. And I think it's something similar to that that Germany has in terms of a little bit different, but their their education is very targeted. Very, I, I think the country would enormously benefit from something like that. I mean, and I mean, uh, if, if we really want to invest in education and on the other side, of the course, is that universities are pretty much in some cases, they're an outpriced themselves, you know, in terms of the exorbitant cost and the, the fact that some people are coming out of their, their leaving college with enormous debts because of it so you know that's the the downside of it all but yeah i'm, I'm very happy with the, our institution here at alney and, and i i'm a big proponent of community colleges obviously oh yeah no i think it's a phenomenal idea to let people go out there and try community college like they would high school for free i i, I think 
at a place like Olney, at a place like John A. Logan in Carterville, Illinois, at a place like Miami Dade, which is I think is still the largest community college in the country. Uh, I think it's a fantastic idea. Not everyone is made for college, but how can they know unless they try it out? And I think, I think it it's going to help society. I really do believe yeah. that it's a high tide is going to raise all boats. I don't care about the fact that, yes, well, if everyone has a college degree, then they have no more value because of the supply and demand factor. Well, that's true. Um, the monetary value of a degree, if everyone had one, would be much less. Yes. But think about the value in totality of just having a more educated, smarter society. That is going to reap rewards like we don't even understand at this point. So, yeah, no, I think it's a yeah, great think, idea. And you know, it'd be nice if the whole, you know, obviously many states do not have as, as developed community college systems as we do as in Illinois, uh, you know, or as affordable. So, so that, yeah, that, that could be, I, I you know, I'd, I'd like to see the future going forward to academically to include something like that. No question. So if anybody wants to follow you or find out more information about you and what you do and what you're working on, how can they do that? Uh, well, let's see. Again, my, my, uh, again, J our JFK historical group, obviously is our website. We have updates on all our conferences and upcoming things. Obviously, uh, I'm on Facebook like everybody else. <laughs> you can look me up and and find me and follow me and i'll probably follow you right back you know so if anybody's you know we put up a lot of put up a lot of information about what's going on with us and uh you know for around the country so i encourage everybody to to you know look me up uh if you got any questions questions about our upcoming conferences we'd be glad to answer them and uh and, uh, again, I, ST, I really appreciate you having me on today and giving me a chance to speak out about these things. I'm ST Patrick. This is the Midnight Rider News Show. And from the other side of the mountain, on the best side of midnight, I wish you peace.